إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه أما بعد فإن أستقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثة ثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. إخواني last week we looked at the أقائد of the founding fathers of the school of Deoband and we mentioned the works of their uh, their founding father one of their founding fathers Imdadullah al makki and we also mentioned some of the works of uh, Ashraf Ali Thanwi and others from amongst their senior founding fathers and we looked at what their beliefs were we looked at what their creed was and we mentioned that from them comes you know the tabliki jamaat from them comes various other sufi subdivisions and we mentioned that their beliefs in the modern day, they are hidden. They are hidden and their true reality is not known until you begin to look back into their works. And we mentioned, the brother asked a question, Jazahullahu Khairan, he mentioned that, look, if you speak to a Diyobandi brother, then, you know, a lot of them say we're not upon this, etc. And we clarified and we said, look, a lot of the people who ascribe themselves to the school or the Diyobandi school, they don't know what they're upon. And then we said the whole purpose of us doing this is not an attack on any uh, particular individual. Rather, it's a clarification so that we can advise our brothers and sisters and call them to the, uh, to the, to the aqidah of the Salaf al-Salih, that which the Prophet ﷺ was upon, that which the companions were upon. And in seeking to expose these beliefs of these deviated groups, we're not attacking people, rather this is an invitation to our brothers and sisters in Islam. Come back, learn your aqidah. Learn your aqidah from the Quran and from the Sunnah, not from somebody who comes 1400 years, 1300 years later and he actually contradicts that which the Prophet ﷺ and his companions radiallahu anhum ajma'een were upon. Today we're going to look at the aqidah of the Brelwis. The aqidah of the Brelwis. I consider this something extremely important, of utmost importance. Why? Because most of us being from the Indian subcontinent, from the Asian subcontinent, vast, vast portions of our family will be Brelvis. Vast portions of our friends will be Brelvis. Vast portions of our entire villages and our, you know, if you come from small heath, 90% of it is Brelvi. If you, you know, most of the people living in the UK today, they follow some aspect of Brelwia. They follow some aspect of these Sufi tariqas. And again, in, in exposing what the founding fathers were upon, Ikhwani, what's the aim? The aim is to invite our Brelvi brothers and sisters, those people who are in doubt, and we invite them, look, study your aqidah. Study your aqidah. Go back to the works of your founding fathers. See what they were upon. Because Ikhwani, as we all know, a building which is built upon weak foundations, eventually it's going to crumble. It might look beautiful. It might be very extravagant. But at the first sign of any uh, earthquake or any wind, this building is going to come tumbling down. So it's extremely important that we have firm foundations. And foundations in this deen are that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down in the Quran, that which we have in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as understood by the companions. And the first three generations of scholars and all those people who follow in their footsteps. I'm going to mention his works, his words from, majority of it is from his book called Al Malfuzat. This is like, um, it's a book of his, which it contains a lot of his sayings, and from his sayings, we can derive his beliefs. And actually, there's not a lot of interpretation needed because this man, he made it so clear what he was upon that when you just read it, and you listen to it, you don't need to interpret it, it doesn't really need to be ex explained. Alhamdulillah, the falsehood is absolutely clear. 
the first thing that I want to mention, those people who call themselves or upon Brelwia, they always call themselves Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'a. They, all them, they always call themselves the Sunni Muslims. They always call themselves, we are the haqq we follow, you know, we are the Sunnis and nobody else is Sunni. We need to look at why this term Sunni, it was derived. The term Sunni was used to differentiate between those who were Shia and those who were not. So you're either Sunni or you are Shia. And it's not enough to just say we are Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and now you consider because you've given yourself this term, you are the Haqq. Another proof that they use that they are upon truth and everybody else is upon falsehood, they say, well, look, there are more of us. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, and they mentioned this big group, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and they say, look, we are the Jama'ah. There's more of us than there are of you. Therefore, we are upon the Haqq, you are upon the falsehood. Ikhwani, how is this any different to what the Quraysh said to the Messenger ﷺ? How can we and our forefathers, how can we be incorrect? How can we be incorrect? The, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Talib, when he died, the Prophet ﷺ was saying, look, just say la ilaha illallah. I will, you know, intercede for you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who were around him, Abu Jahl, etc. They said, are you going to forsake the religion of your forefathers? So, ikhwani, we have to question ourselves. If this is our, uh, our mindset that what I am born upon, what I am raised upon is the truth, then ask yourself the question, if you were born a Hindu, if you were born a Sikh, would you come to the Haqq? Would you come to Islam? Because your attitude would be, I'm born a Sikh, I'm born a Hindu, and my forefathers are upon this, how could they all be wrong? So then, we have to understand that we as Muslims, our search is for the Haqq, our search is for the truth. The Messenger alayhi salam said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this in the Quran. The companions were upon this. This is our religion. It's not based on numbers. It's not based on, uh, you know, strength of men, etc. Let's remember that there will be prophets on Yawm Qiyamah who will come followed by 10 people. One will come followed by fi five people. And the Messenger alayhi salam has mentioned others will come and they will be completely alone. They will be completely alone. So do we say that those people who never accepted them were on the haqq because there were more of them? No. We take the haqq even if we are the only person upon that. Okay, I'm going to mention ta'ala some points now. Approximately 20 of his sayings from which we can derive the aqidah of the Brelwiya. Ahmad Raza Khan, he was asked, are there Muslims amongst the jinns and the angels? Somebody asked him this question. Ya Sheikh, do we have Muslims from amongst the jinn and the angels as well? He replied, an angel became Muslim and she would often come to visit me. An angel became Muslim and she would often come to visit me. One day she did not come so I questioned her. And she replied, one of my close friends died in Hindustan. So I went there and on the way I saw Iblis praying her salah. This is in Al-Malfuzat, uh, chapter number one, I think it's the 29th saying in his book. So he affirms that there are angels who, some are Muslim and some are not. And he says that the angels, he mentions that this angel is female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the Quraysh, the pagan Quraysh. Do you yourself take sons and then you make the angels the daughters of Allah? i.e. you make them women, you make them feminine. He is doing the same thing, Ikhwani, and then he falls into this major error. He says, I saw Iblis praying the Salah. I saw Iblis pray, praying the Salah. That's the first saying. Again, I don't think we need to go into this too much. The second thing, his second saying. Somebody asked, Ahmed Raza Khan concerning the drowning of Junaid Baghdadi and he said Ya Allah and he drowned so somebody asked him about this Ahmed Raza Khan replied it was on the river of Hadiqa where Sayyidi Junaid, Junaid Baghdadi was traveling and he started to walk on the water as he did on the land an important point here we mentioned last week how the Diyobundis they gave 
unhuman or superhuman characteristics to their awliya. They gave superhuman characteristics to their awliya. Here we have Ahmed Raza Khan giving this same thing to Junaid Baghdadi. He walked on the water as he did on the land. So he says, another man who was behind him also needed to get across that same river, but there was no boat at the time. He saw Junaid walking across the water, so he asked, how may I cross? So Junaid is walking on the water, as the Christians say Isa alayhi salam did. He was walking on the water, a man behind him says, look, I need to get to that same place on the other side of this water. He, what do I do? So Junaid says, listen to this. Listen to what Ahmed Raza Khan says, uh, says that Junaid Baghdadi said to this man. He says, say, Ya Junaid, Ya Junaid. So the man did this and he started to say, Ya Junaid, Ya Junaid. And he started to walk on the water as he did on the land. Again, they call upon their awliya for things that nobody can give to you. Things that are not in their, in their ability and they call upon them. When he reached the middle, so this man has started reach the, his middle now, so he started walking on the water saying, Ya Junaid, Ya Junaid, this is the only thing that's keeping him afloat. Ahmed Raza Khan continues, he says, when he reached the middle, the accursed shaitan put whisperings in his heart and Junaid started to say, Ya Allah. Ikhwani, look at this clear kufr, clear disbelief. You're calling upon Junaid and he says shaitan comes to him and he puts whisperings into his heart and the man now starts to say Ya Allah, he actually starts to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The accursed shaitan, shaitan put whisperings in his heart that Junaid is saying Ya Allah and he said to me say Ya Junaid. So I started to say Ya Allah and he immediately he fell into the water. Immediately when he called upon Allah he fell into the water. He says the man who, who's fallen in. He said, oh Junaid, I'm going to die. So Junaid said, say ya Junaid, ya Junaid. He started to say again and eventually he crossed the river. When they were both across, the man said to Junaid, why is it that when you say ya Allah, you walk and you do not drown? And when I say ya Junaid, sorry, and when I say ya Allah, I drown. Does everybody understand this? So Junaid is walking on the water saying, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, all the way across. And the man says, I want to follow you. So the man says, to, Junaid says to him, okay, say Ya Junaid. He says, Ya Junaid, Ya Junaid, he gets to the middle. Shaitan comes to him and says, say Ya Allah. So he says, Ya Allah, he begins to drown. So then Junaid says, no, no, you need to say Ya Junaid. So he says, Ya Junaid, and he makes it to the other side. Then he asks him, he says, why is it that when you say Ya Allah, you don't drown? But when I say Ya Allah, I drown. Junaid said, Oh, oh my, oh my child, or oh my old childish one, you have not even reached Junaid yet and you want to reach Allah? Ikhwani, look at this. Look at this. Again, this is evidence of the Sufi or the Brelvi Aqidah. We need to go through intermediaries. And I mentioned it previously once before. I mentioned it previously once before, if you want to get to the roof of the house, you use the ladder. If you want to get to the king, you speak to the ministers. Ikhwani, how do you set up an example to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creation? Subhanallah amma yushrikun. And we mention how Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says, look, why if you needed to go to a king, would you go through his ministers? Are you saying that the, normally you go to the king you, through his ministers because the king, he is biased and he doesn't listen to the ordinary folk? Are you saying Allah won't listen to you? Normally the king is too busy to listen to the ordinary folk so he only listens to his ministers. Are you saying Allah is too busy to listen to you? Ikhwani, crazy, crazy beliefs. Again, this is in al Malfuzat 131. But look, he says the shaitan put whisperings into his heart, making him call upon Allah. So they will call upon everybody and his dog, but they won't call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third saying of Ahmed Raza Khan Brelvi. He, say, he says, there were two walis, two walis. And an important point here, again, 
we're just extracting points of benefit from the Brelvi Aqidah two walis they will call everybody a wali if he wears a green turban and carries a tasbih and he has a, a, an orange beard and he you know he, he he seems pious that's it he is now a wali he doesn't pray he can't read quran with tajweed he you know he's involved in riba he's involved in ta'wiz and shirk and magic and kufr but he's a wali and when he dies he becomes an even bigger wali this is from their aqidah, ikhwani. Everybody and his dog is a wali. Ahmed Raza Khan, he writes, there were two walis and they lived on either side of a wide river. They lived on either side of a wide river. One of them made rice pudding. What do we call rice pudding? Kheer. One of them made kheer. One of them made kheer and he told his servant to take it to his friend. The servant replied, Oh master, how can I? There is a river in the way. How will I get across? I have no sailing equipment. And the man replied, this wali he replies, go to the river and say to it, I have come from a man who has not slept with his wife. The servant was amazed as the wali had children. Ahmed Azza Khan is saying this himself. So the man says, go to the river, speak to the river and tell the river that you've come from a man who doesn't have who hasn't slept with his wife. And the man is amazed, Raza Khan, he says, but this man, he was amazed because he had children. Nonetheless, he thought it was important to follow what the wali had said. Let's stop here. Blind following. Blind following. He hasn't slept with his wife, according to him, yet he has children. So then how does he have children? Are they like Isa alayhi salam, no father? Are they like Adam alayhi salam, no father? Ikhwani, common sense. But these people in their blind following of their walis, they will kill a man who opposes their wali. They will burn a house down and they will do everything. They will attack you in defense of their wali. Not in defense of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Haqq. They will attack you blindly on the words of their wali. So he said, he thought it was important to follow what the wali had said. He did as he was instructed and immediately a path formed between the river. Like uh, Musa alayhi salam. Like Musa alayhi salam when he had Fir'aun behind him, he had the river in front of him and he struck it and the, and the path opened up. So this wali has done something similar just by telling him to talk to it. He walked across and gave it to the other wali who ate the rice pudding and said, give my salam to your master. And the servant replied, I can only do that when I get across the river. Now we know what's coming. The man's going to say, go to the river and tell it you've come from such and such. This wali on the other side of the river, he replied, say to the river, I have come from the one who has not eaten for 30 years, even though he's just eaten the kheer. Think about that. The servant was amazed. The servant was amazed as the wali had just eaten in front of him. He got to the river and he did as he was told and another path was formed between the river and he gave, it gave way to him and he walked across. Ikhwani subhanallah, clear cut, kufr and shirk, clear cut, ignorance and yet they will blind follow their wali, they will blind follow their sheikh, they will blind follow anybody ikhwani who comes to them with beautiful stories. You just bring a beautiful story and you can become their sheikh. This is in 1, 31 and 32. What do they believe about their awliya? What do they believe about their awliya? We mentioned about the deals, the deal bundis. That there was a man who, when he wanted to go and do tawaf, he just used to like, you know, he just used to take a couple of steps and he was immediately transported to Makkah. And he would do his tawaf. Other people we mentioned from the Dio Bundis, he's, he was asked, you know, I've come from the, uh, the majlis of the queen. And he said, you know, I walk on the suburbs so that the, they, the suburbs, suburbs will become inhabited. All sorts of crazy things, ikhwani. And we mentioned how they believe that Prophet alayhi salam learned Urdu from the scholars of Dio Bund, etc. Now let's look at one of the statements of Ahmed Raza Khan about what he says about his beer. He writes, our peer can be present in every place, in 10,000 places, in 10,000 cities at one time. 10,000 places, 10,000 cities at one time. 
Subhanallah. And he gives an example. It was possible for Sayyidi Fatih Muhammad Quddus to be present in 10 different, loca 10 different gatherings at once. 10 different gatherings at once. And obviously from this, we have, from this corrupt uh, aqidah, we have the fact that they believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam visits them in their majalis. When they are singing uh, their, their Nata Sharif and they are doing their Zikr Sharif and they are doing their headbanging Sharif, they believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes and visits them. And so they stand up. They stand up. And to the ordinary man, they think, oh, we're just standing up now because it's heating up a little bit. You know, we're going to do some dance moves. But no, for those of them who are well versed, they stand up in honor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you will even go to some places where they will have a chair like this one. I hope the brothers are not believing this aqidah. They will leave a chair like this one and it will be empty. And they will say this is for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to sit on when he arrives. Look at this kufr ikhwani and it all stems from such beliefs. So he says 10,000 places, 10,000 sittings at one time and then he mentions this man Muhammad Quddus and he could be in 10 gatherings at once. Then he gives an example for this. For his aqidah, the aqidah of Islam, look at the aqidah or look at the example that he brings. He says, look at Christian Gehnaya. He was a disbeliever and he would also be able to be present in a number of places at once. So he says, because the disbelievers can do it, surely our awliya can do it. So he, in, in one way, he's affirming the beliefs of the kuffar. He is affirming kufr, that their people can be in 10 different gatherings at once. And he's saying, well, if they can do it, if they can be in 10 places, well, we can be in 10,000 places. And this is uh, Al-Malfuzat 1, 141 to 142. Another thing that he mentions about the awliya, he says the earth and the heavens cannot remain in existence if it were not for the presence of a ghawth. Now a ghawth, ikhwani, is like a person who they turn to and they say that he's been given special rights and authority by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he looks after the affairs of the creation. And ikhwani, subhanallah, he looks after the, crea uh, the affairs of the creation. So they decide. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala lahu al khalqu wal amr. For Allah is the creation and the command. But according to these people, they say that the ghawth, this, uh, you know, this source of help, this can be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they look after the affairs of the creation. Ahmad Raza Khan, he writes about the Hanafi madhab and they always ascribe themselves to the Hanafi madhab and if you try and debate them then you bring them proofs, you bring them evidences about their aqidah but the first thing they will say is you ghayr muqallideen, you people who don't do taqlid and we say look, let's put the issues of fiqh to one side, let's talk about your aqidah and we're not talking about this issue of taqlid etc, let's put this to one side, let's talk about your aqidah you make taqlid of Imam Abu Hanifa, they say yes. You say Allah is everywhere, they say yes. Didn't Imam Abu Hanifa say that the one who says he doesn't know where Allah is, is a kafir? The one, didn't Imam Abu Hanifa say that the one who says he doesn't know if Allah is above his arsh is a kafir? And then they will come and they will, because you've got them into a corner now, they come and they, they will attack you personally. And this is nothing new, ikhwani. About the Hanafi madhab, Raza Khan, he writes, the Hanafi madhab will be more beloved and liked by Allah and his messenger. So you come on your muqiyama and you say, I'm a Hanafi, you'll be more beloved than somebody who says he's a Shafi'i or somebody who says, well, I don't follow a madhab, actually, I take the strongest opinion. You are, look at this, he himself made taqlid, but at the same time, he's encouraging taqlid upon others. Not only taqlid of a madhab, ikhwani, taqlid of your sheikh, Taqlid of every single story that comes to you. Taqlid of every awliya, every peed sab, ikhwani, their religion is based upon a foundation of blind following. Blind following, uh, you know, uh, to the extreme. Further, I want to mention to you this story that Ahmed Raza Khan, he writes. And again, we hear story, story, story. 
The same as the Dio Bundis. The same as the Dio Bundi elder scholars. Story, story, story. We don't hear ayah of Quran, hadith, understanding of the Salaf. We hear story. And from these stories, they derive their aqidah. It's very, very dangerous, Ikhwani. Ahmad Raza Khan, he writes, and Sayyidi Abdul Wahhab Sha'arani was from the major awliya. On the grave of Sayyid Ahmad Badawi Kabir, there would be annual festivities and gatherings. Again, a characteristic of the Barelwis is they take their graves as places of worship, they take their graves as places of festivities, food, flowers, uh, lights, dancing, everything. Abdul Wahhab went and he Abdul Wahhab went and he noticed a slave girl of a businessman. He looked away as the first look was by Shaitan. But he liked the girl. So Abdul Wahhab carried out sorry, Abdul Wahhab carried and to the grave of Sayyidi Ahmad Badawi Kabir and a voice was heard. So he's at this man's uh, grave now. He's taken a look at this slave girl. He liked her, but he's looked away, mashaAllah. Now he's gone to the grave of this holy man. And listen to what, and this man, uh, the, the, the person who likes a slave, his name is Abdul Wahhab. Ironic. But he liked the girl. So Abdul Wahhab carried out and to the grave of Sayyidi Ahmad Badawi Kabir and a voice was heard. Abdul Wahhab, do you like the slave girl? He replied, yes. I should not conceal anything from the Shaykh. So a voice was heard again. Okay, I have given you the girl as a gift. The person in the grave has given the slave girl as a gift to the man who's alive. But the man inside the grave is dead. Now Abdul Wahhab is silent and he's thinking that the girl belongs to the businessman. And Hazur is giving me her as a gift. Suddenly the businessman appeared and sacrificed the girl for the person in the grave. Then all of a sudden another voice was heard and it was said, Abdul Wahhab, what are you waiting for? Take her into the room and fulfill your desires. Al Malfuzat 3, 309 to 310. I'm not going to mention anything more on that because we have sisters in the room. Ahmed Raza Khan was asked, is it permissible to say Allah Sahib? And this might be something, uh, you know, we, amongst the, the Asians we say Allah Mia, Allah, Allah Ji, Allah Sahib. And I want to mention this because he says, yes, this is permissible. But Ikhwani, I'm not an expert in the Urdu language, but the word Sahib or Ji, etc., it implies a body. So, you know, when we call upon our mother, we say, Ammi ji, or, or etc. This implies a body. And obviously, when you use this, when referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are falling into uh, Mujassima, uh, you know, this what this deviated sect they did, and they gave Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a body, the way we have bodies, etc., etc. What does Ahmad Raza Khan, what does he say about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he is in his grave. When he is in his grave. Even if a man was to say this one thing, Ikhwani, and there was no retraction and there was no taking it back, we would hate him for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He says in Malfuzat 3, 310, the wives of the Prophet are presented to him alayhi salam in his grave and he indulges in nightly acts with them. Subhanallah. Ikhwani, statements of kufr, statements of disbelief. And the Salafiyun and the scholars of the past and the companions are free of this disgusting uh, slander upon the Prophet ﷺ and his wives. Ikhwani, what do they say about making tawaf around graves? What do they say? What does Ahmad al Zakhan he say about making tawaf around graves? He says it's permissible in his Malfuzat 3329. I think we're on the 11th point now. Um, we find all the time that they are saying Ya Rasulullah, Ya this, Ya Abdul Qadir Al Jailani and they will call upon their Shaykh uh, and they will call upon him in this way. And Ahmad al Zakhan he says it is permissible to say Ya Ghawth. He says it's permissible to say Ya Ghawth. Ikhwani like you know if I had a brother in front of me and I say Ya Harun there's no problem with this because he's in front of me, he's mawjood, I can call upon him. Ya Bilal, for example. And I can call upon him and he can answer me and we can, you know, we can, we can interact. But if somebody is on the other side of the world, this type of saying, Ya, is a type of call, a type of need. The way we call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, Ya Rabb, etc., etc. We call out to Allah in a way of us bringing ourselves down and 
saying that we only rely on Allah uh, you know, to, to answer our du'as and this is a form of shirk when it's used if the person is not in front of you, etc. Ahmad Raza Khan, he explains that the characteristic of a holy person who has abstained from the world and has reached a higher level of meditation. He says, there is a man, Sayyidi Musa Suhag, this man was a male. I have to point this out at this stage. Sayyidi Musa, he's a man. Remember this because as we go through this story, again, story, you're going to see what he says. This guy is, this person is a man. He says, there is a man, Sayyidi Musa Suhag, rahmatullahi alayhi, and he was from the well-known mediators, and he has a tomb in, ah in Ahmedabad. I had the pleasure of seeing him. What does he say next? He presented himself as a female. Ikhwani, we have these people in our society called cross-dressers. I had the pleasure of seeing him. He presented himself as a female. His name was Musa. One time, a seizure. This is when they have this seizure. They go into like this higher state and they start frothing at the mouth. They urinate themselves sometimes. They, it's a disgrace, disgraceful state which the Sufis, they put up, they, you know, themselves into. He came upon him. So like... He went into this seizure, this state, it came upon him. So the elder Sufis and the king approached him to supplicate for them. So they believe that when a person is in this state, he's there, he's shaking and he's having a fit and he's frothing at the mouth and he's wet himself, he's closer to Allah. Ask him to make dua for you. So when he had this seizure, the people came to him and, he said, and they said, make dua for us. He kept on denying them and would say, am I capable of supplicating? Eventually, when the pleas became too much to bear, he picked up a stone and took it towards the bangles on his other arm and he looked to the sky and said, send the Mia, i.e. send the husband uh, or take your bride. He's looking up at the sky. He's referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rain. Okay, he says, S send your rain or take back your bride. Is that correct? So he says, send your rain or take back your bride. He's talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, send the rain down or take back your bride. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. Clear shirk, clear kufr. This same man, Sayyidi Musa Suhag, again, man, was on his way to the Friday prayer and he was dressed as a woman and on the way he saw one of the judges of the city so he decided to quickly take his clothes off and dress as a male and he takes his bangles and his jewelry off as well he went to the masjid and after hearing the sermon and when the jama'ah was about to pray the imam said Allahu Akbar for the commencement of the prayer and suddenly Sayyidi Musa Suhag's situation changed and he said Allahu Akbar my husband is ever living he will not die and these people are widowing me my husband, he's referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as his husband. This is clear kufr, clear disbelief. This is in Al-Malfuzat 2, 240. Another thing I want to mention, Ikhwani, the Brelvis, they want to worship. They have it in their heart that they want to worship the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Raza Khan, he says, if granting uluhiyah was possible and within the power of me, then I would have granted uluhiyah to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Lordship. I would have granted lordship, divinity, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Malfuzat 2.49. He also, he was asked, what shall we recite to remove the whisperings of shaitan? He replied, recite... I believe in Allah and his messenger who is the first and the last, the manifest and the hidden and he has knowledge of all things. He's referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet alayhi wasallam, when he would make dua sometimes he would say about Allah Antal awwalu falaysa qabalaka shay Antal akhiru falaysa ba'daka shay And this is uh, one of the du'as that you make in ruqya when you're, when you're inciting and you're making dua and you're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure this person. Oh Allah, you are the first and there is nothing before you. Oh Allah, you are the last, there is nothing after you. And this man, he is saying this about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They also believe that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam is Hazir and Nazir. Ahmad al Khan, he established the attribute of omnipresence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, omnipresence is a specific attribute of the Messenger of Allah and he is present everywhere and no one is associated with him in this attribute. 
even though, even though he seemingly contradicts himself when he says that their, their ghawth and their awliya can be in many, many different places at once, he then at the same time says the Prophet wasallam is everywhere, is everywhere. Again, ikhwani, clear disbelief or clear deviation and clear destruction. Ikhwani, we know that seeking help from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shirk. Now I need to clarify this statement because they say, well you Wahhabis, why do you go to the doctor then? Because you're seeking help from the doctor and yet you say this, this seeking help from anyone other than Allah is shirk. Ikhwani, when you ask of a person that which is within his ability, so your car has broken down and there are a few brothers and you ask, the brothers, Ikhwani, can you give me a hand to push this car? This is not shirk because this is within their abilities. But when you ask of someone or something, that which is not within its abilities, Oh Ahmed Raza Khan, make it rain. Ikhwani, this is not within their abilities. You are seeking something from somebody which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give. You are seeking assistance from something which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can assist with. This is what we say is shirk. So we don't mean wholesale, the way they take it and the way they manipulate it. Ahmad Azza Khan, he says, Ikhwani, once we've established this, he says, whenever I have sought help, then I have always said, Ya Ghawth, O Ghawth, O Ghawth. Once I intended to seek help from another saint, but his name could not come upon my tongue, but only Ya Ghawth would come out. So by the very definition, if somebody was to say, he's saying Ya Ghawth and he's referring to Allah, his next statement clarifies that because he says, when I sought to seek help from another saint. So when he says Ya Ghawth, he's referring to a saint. And then when he says, when I sought to seek help from another saint, nothing would come out, only Ya Ghawth. And this is in al Malfuzat 483. I want to mention a few other things, Ikhwani. What do the Brailvis say about Ahmad Raza Khan? What do the Brailvis say in their works about Ahmad Raza Khan? The first thing that they say is he is infallible. They say he is infallible. Abdul Hakim Qadri, he wrote, The pen and tongue of Ahmad Raza Khan was safe from all kinds of slips and errors in spite of it being known that an alim always falls into some kind of error. However, he did not even commit a simple mistake. So he's saying, it's known that the alims, you know, you, you speak about Islam, etc. Nobody's perfect. You're going to make mistakes. But he says, as for Ahmad Raza Khan, his pen was saved. He never ever made any mistakes whatsoever. Listen to what a man wrote in uh, this man Ayub Rizvi. He wrote in his book, Granter of creation, Ahmad Raza. You are the one who removes my difficulties, Ahmad Raza. Who gives me? Who has given? Whatever was given, you have given, Ahmad Raza. In both worlds is your support. Yes, help me, Shah Ahmad Raza. In Hashr, when there will be the heat of Qiyamah, hide and cover me, Ahmad Raza. When the tongues dry because of thirst, give me a drink from Kawthar, Ahmad Raza. Help or accompany in my grave and in resuscitation and in Hashr. Be the one who removes my difficulties, Ahmad Raza. You are the giver and I am your receiver. I am yours and you are mine, Ahmad Raza. Ikhwani, clear shirk, clear kufr. Ahmad Raza Khan, he says about himself, he says in Anwar Raza, uh, on page 319, he says, I am the monarch of the domain of speech. The people should accept whatever I say. What do we, as Ahlul Sunnah, we say, Ikhwani, we accept from the people that which is according to the Quran and the Sunnah. That which is the Haqq, we accept. But we don't accept that which is falsehood. Ahmad Raza is saying, whatever I say, just accept it. Just accept it. Ikhwani, we have somebody in our society who calls himself the dog of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We probably know who he is. But subhanallah, he is not the first one to say this. Ahmad Raza Khan, he called himself a dog himself. He says in Hada'iq Bakshish by this man Barelwi, he says, no one asks about you and no one cares for you because the dogs like you are numerous and I am the dog. Ikhwani, this, he seems that he maybe had some mental issue, Allahu Alam, because I don't think any normal person will call themselves the dog 
or a dog. And so maybe he's trying to be very humble, put himself down. But Ikhwani, subhanallah, this is not humility, this is absolute ignorance. Seeking help. Ikhwani, there's a lot to mention. They, would, they seek help from um, uh, Abdul Qadir al Jailani, who was a Hanbali scholar. Um, Ahmad al Zakhan, he writes When you are confronted with difficulty, then seek help from the people in the graves. This is Al Aman Wal Ala by Ahmad Raza Khan, page 46. Dar al Tabligh are the publishers of that book. He says, When you are confronted with difficulty, seek help from the people in the graves. Seek help from the people in the graves. That's why, Ikhwani, uh, you always, always find if you have somebody who's been ill, he's afflicted with magic or jinn possession, he goes to a Bir Sab, very, they, they have like a, a three stage. Uh, three, a three stage uh, you know, treatment the first treatment is Taviz the first treatment is Taviz and calling upon Abdul Qadir Al Jilani and the second treatment Ikhwani is going to the graves and asking of the graves going to the graves and asking of the graves and I personally have heard from somebody who used to go to Hanswa Cemetery and they had certain graves from which they would take uh, elements of the dust from those graves and then they would uh, bring them back and they would perform acts of magic etc etc upon this Ikhwani you know uh, subhanallah falsehood upon falsehood another distinguishing characteristic of the Brelvis is that they build massive shrines massive tombs over the graves this man Ahmed Yar, uh, Ahmed Yar Gujarati, he wrote, In honor of the dead, it is permissible in the Sharia to build their graves. Even though I, was, I, I believe it's uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala an who said that the Prophet alayhi salam, he gave me an order, you know, go and destroy any grave that is taller than a handspan. Taller than a handspan, go and just destroy it. Go and knock it down. And this is what they have against um, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab rahimahullah that when these graves were all over the arabian peninsula he came and he knocked them down he was only reviving the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and yet they say he was dis, you know he was desecrating the graves he was you know uh, being uh, disrespectful etc etc other things that we can mention, Ikhwani, putting covers, turbans and garments on the graves. Ahmad Raza Khan Brailvi, he said, building tombs and similar structures is necessary such that the blessed graves are distinguished from the common graves and people magnify them. Ikhwani, look at this. What are you opening the door to? Shirk, calling upon the graves. And as we've mentioned, this is part of the aqidah. People like Ahmad Raza Khan and these other awliya, of shaitan they are not only of Allah they are only of shaitan yet their graves are huge and then we have the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the best of creation after the prophets and messengers and yet they don't have this and so you think that you are better than them and you are more worthy of being distinguished ikhwani again uh, subhanallah uh, misguidance upon misguidance other things that they do ikhwani they do the Ur Sharif, you know, Milad and Nabi. They do the, I think, the four day Khatam, uh, I think the 40 day Khatam when somebody dies and they believe that that person's spirit comes back and they make all of his favorite foods. And Ahmad Raza Khan, he himself, he left like a will. He said, When I die, bring this type of food and bring this type of food and this type of food to me. Ikhwani, all of these things, they come from Hindu traditions. Hindu traditions. Go and speak to a Hindu and he'll tell you, This is what we used to do. Oh, this is what we do and this is what we believe in. Ikhwani, subhanallah. We'll bring it to an end here. But in ending, Ikhwani, what's the point of all of this? The point is not to attack any particular individual. Rather, the point is to expose those individuals who attack the aqidah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the aqidah of the companions, the aqidah of the imams of the salaf and all of those who will follow in their footsteps until yawm al-qiyamah. Ikhwani, it's not just enough to enjoy the good. It's not just enough to sit here, talk about Jannah, talk about Tawheed. We also have to make you aware of these false ideologies. Of these false ideologies. So inshallah, you will go and teach your children. Will go and teach your neighbors. Allah says, Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your families from a fire. Waqudu nasu wal hijara. Whose fuel is men and stones. 
Ikhwani, not just enough for me to sit here and know this, or you to sit here and know this. Go away, teach your families, because what they are upon, if they are following Brelwiya, Diobandiya, this Tabliki Jamaat, they are upon falsehood. They are upon falsehood, and success is only going to be Yawm al Qiyamah, the person who was upon that which the Prophet and his companions were upon. So it's upon us, Ikhwani, to go away, learn this Aqeedah. This Aqeedah is not going to come to us out of the sky. We have to learn this Aqeedah and we have to warn against all that which opposes the Aqeedah of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions and all those who follow on their, in their footsteps until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this misguidance. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this kufr and shirk. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expose those people who are spreading this in the name of the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Because if you truly love Allah, you will follow his messenger. And if you truly follow his messenger والسلام, you will take the path of the Ahlul Hadith. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.